we're going to look back at the manna and the wilderness. What we covered last week as far as, as how it's happened historically and how it's going to happen prophetically. Remember, we took this section right here, brought it down to right here. We got Revelation chapter 12 right there. Who remembers what happened in Revelation chapter 12? Anybody remember? You still don't know? <laughs> there was a war, all right? If you remember, now I didn't draw it up here, the war was taking place when we draw the earth and we make a line for the, uh, round for the first heaven and then we come up to the second heaven and we draw the deep in there. So we got a one, we got a two, we got a three and um, we've got God and his throne up here. We got this area called the deep, all right? So... That was going to take place there in the second heaven. Remember, Satan has always wanted to get to the third heaven, never has been able to, never will. And he's going to, he's the prince of the power of the air. The air represents the first and the second heaven, those areas there. And what's going to happen is he's going to get cast down to the earth, and ultimately he will be cast down into hell, into the center of the earth there. All right? Earth rotates, bottomless pit, never has a true bottom there, all right? So, we also, we just went ahead and put up the seven-point outline for all the churches. These are the four churches that are in chapter two. We've covered the first three. We're hoping to get to Thyatira tonight. Um, three of the four churches talk about Baal worship. Baal worship goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel, back over here in early Genesis, and you have got Baal worship that runs all the way through, and then God's going to put an end to it ultimately in his return, and there at the final battle at the end of the kingdom there. It will all be done away with. But religion, Baal worship, all the false religions are built around Baal worship. Lots of false religions will teach that Jesus is not God. But when you take any religion, any religious system that gets away from Scripture, if it gets away from Scripture, it is susceptible to the teachings of Baal worship. And we've looked, at, it mentions the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the deeds of the Nicolaitans and that group that's kind of been there throughout. The, the Bible doesn't really say a whole lot about those guys there, but obviously they're going to, their doctrine and their deeds are going to come up during this time period there. So with that, I want, let's go ahead and go. I want you to look, I highlighted these because we also mentioned how prevalent that Satan as the Antichrist will be during this time. The three and a half year point, there's going to be a lot of reference points for this period right here. One of the other things, not only Revelation 12, but when he comes down to the earth, it, that's the place where it's called the abomination of desolation. <laughs> Does anybody know what the abomination of desolation is? Does anybody know what Old Testament book it came from? One two, three. Daniel. All right, good. All right, Daniel prophesies about the abomination of desolation. That's when the Antichrist, Satan personified, is going to go into the temple and proclaim himself to be God and to be the ruler over Baal worship there. And you're going to have that terrible time period. Remember the first, what do we call the first three and a half years? During that time, the witnesses, the 144,000 and the two, their job will be what? Anybody remember? Starts with an E. Evangelism, right. They're going to go out, try to reach all the Jews. And then the last three and a half years, they endure to the end. So it is what? Evasion, yes. Thus, when they are evading and they can't take the mark of the beast, they're going to need the manna. This will represent the wilderness. So we were looking at all of that. And we looked at some scriptures that went through. And we're going to glance at those uh, quickly tonight. We won't go back over all of them, but we're going to look at them real quick because we had them up on the screen last time. But let's look real quick at the book of Hosea because it's important for you to understand this thing about 
the, um, the wilderness, that it's not just talking about back here. That when you look at it in scripture, you got to know if it's talking about what went on back here or what's going to be going on during this time period right there. So Hosea chapter 2, when we go to verse 14 here, therefore behold, I will allure her. Who remembers who her is? Her represents the nation of Israel, correct. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. So after all these vials and all this tribulation that's going on, God's going to protect them and get them through. Now, there are going to be people who are going to be martyred for not taking the mark of the beast. How will they be martyred? They're going to be headed, right. So... In verse 15, it says, And I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt there. So, a reference back to that time period. Uh, We go over to Exodus. Exodus 16. And verse 14 here. Exodus 16 and verse 14. All right. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing as small as the hoarfrost on the ground there. So probably something similar to maybe like a snowflake size there, the hoar frost. If the H-O-A-R, the hoary head, means something that is white. All right. We covered that. And, and when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. They didn't know what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. So we know it's bread. We know it's color. We kind of know what it looks like. You're starting to give us some... Um, Some description there. All right, we jump down to verse 32, and it says this. Well, let's go. Verse 31. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And so there must have been a natural, you know, sometimes you would think if it was a cracker or just some kind of piece of bread that it would be kind of plain. But now we see that it's got a sweet taste to it. It's got that honey flavor to it there. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commandeth, fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And we talked about that last week because it's important. As they put it into the ark, there were three things we said that went into the ark. It was the manna. It was the, uh, close, it was whose, not Moses, Uh, anybody know? Aaron's, what's, rod, that, budded, okay, Uh, Aaron's rod that budded, and you had the law, so you got those three things, but the manna, we see the significance of it because as we're studying over here during this time, he says, I want your generations to see it and to remember it. Why? Because the nation of Israel, there was going to come a time in prophecy that this day was going to come to pass. And they were going to have to remember it so that while they're being tempted and tried during this difficult time, they don't give in to the mark of the beast. They know that God's going to supernaturally protect them. They might say, well, hey, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you can't buy, you can't sell, you're going to die. And God says, no, you're not. I'm going to take you into this place. I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to speak peaceably unto you. And I'm going to feed you there. So you see that thing. Now, we covered some things about Psalm 23 last week. We're not going to go back through that. We were just showing how that Psalm 23 um, shows some things there that are referencing this time where it talks about, Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Psalm 23, and even the book of Psalms, is not just a place where you go to find comfort. It's not just a poetical book. It is a what book? Starts with a P. 
prophetical book. Much prophecy in the book of Psalms there. And we'll see one of those right here. We looked at it last time in Psalm 78. Uh, let's see, Psalm and then number 78 right here. Psalm 78 and verse 19. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? So we saw that table there in Psalm 23. Now look back one verse. It says, and they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lusts. Now, remember, I told you the word meat can sometimes be the same way we use the word food. It can represent anything that you eat. But right here, it is specifically talking about the flesh of an animal there, of meat the way that we would say it. And remember, they had the thing where God sent the birds and they, they ate it till it was coming out of there. Anybody know that story? He says, you're going to eat this stuff until it comes out of your nose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, there's all sorts of cool things in the Bible y'all missing out on. All right. So, all right. So they've got that. And then look uh, down, let's jump down to verse 25. Here's another reference, 24. And had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels food. He sent them meat to the full. Remember we talked about this new fad, this keto diet. They ain't going to be on the keto diet in the wilderness, man. They're going to have, they're going to have manna going on. It's going to be sweet. It's going to have carbs. It's going to be, I assume it is. I really don't know that. But they say it's bread, so it, it's bread there. You ain't supposed to have bread on the keto diet there. So, all right. Now, from this point, this is where we began to talk a little bit about the wilderness and the manna and Revelation 12. So I want us to go real quickly here to Revelation chapter 12 and look in verse 7. It says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. What would we call those angels? What would be a term for them? Satan's angels. Devils, demons, fallen angels. Okay, so in essence, you need to understand this. Up here, you got good guys and bad guys. There comes that place where the bad guys get sent down to the earth. All right? Now, you need to remember that. And we look in the book of Ezekiel here in a little bit. You're going to see some stuff dealing with Pharaoh and, and the things that are said in the book of Ezekiel that are prophesied. All right? And it becomes pretty, pretty interesting there. But we ended off last time looking at this thing about Satan being called a dragon. Him having that term and that title. Remember, if we go up just a little bit, it says that um, a description of him there in verse 4. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast into the earth. The dragon stood before the woman. That's not the one. Uh, verse 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Now, when we get to chapter 12, we'll deal with some of those numbers there. But I want you to see that there are things in the Bible that are symbolic, that are figurative, and then there are things that are literal. Sometimes in the book of Revelation, it's very difficult to be able to tell the difference. So you really got to pay attention, compare Scripture with Scripture, and look at the context there. All right? So we've got him in this state. Now, we started looking at some of the verses here. We're going to go back to the book of Psalm. And you may remember this from last week. We went to Psalm 74. Psalm 74. And we started in verse 13 here. It says, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads, plural. So, Revelation 12, you got more than one, right? Breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness there. 
So, you've got the book of Psalm. You've got a prophetical statement dealing with the wilderness over here. You're going to have a battle where Satan, described as a dragon with multiple heads, is going to be taken care of. And in essence, he will become... Now, we don't know exactly how this works. And remember, I told you, I said, I just assume God's going to take that rod. Jesus is going to take that rod and smack him upside the head. And he's going to hit him so hard that his head's going to turn to manna. And the manna's going to fall down, going to feed him for 1,260 days. Now, that sounds crazy. But as we look at all this, we started putting all this together. It's like, well, wait a minute. That's the description. That's prophecy. That's, he's going to be right there. They're going to be fed right after that. Somehow, some way. And here's where I want to encourage you in something. This is where, this is the reason that God gave you an imagination. You know, we look at things like this. We can't get all the details. This world system wants to take your imagination and put it in all sorts of different directions. He wants you to be amused and entertained and watch the movies and play the games and do all the different things so that you never come to your Bible, look at this as a reality, and use your imagination to say, man, I wonder what it's really like. It says this, it says this, I see these facts. So what's it really going to be like? And that allows the believer today to be able to sit back and muse on it. Think about it. Remember the word amusement? Well, that's the, what's the word muse mean? That means that you're thinking and you're pondering on something. That when you're amused, it's like an atheist. You are not thinking. That A is placed in front of the word there. So, now, there's a couple other verses I didn't get to last week. I just want to show you. And we're not going to go into too great a detail on this. But there's a couple other things. We're going to go to the book of Job. Now, remember, how many chapters are in the book of Job? Anybody remember? 42. 42. All right. So that ties together. The fact there's 42 chapters in there, um, half of that thing. So there's some some prophetical stuff that goes on in the book of Job. So uh, Job, and remember, once again, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, those are referred to by many just as poetical books, but they are also prophetical books as well. Now watch this, and Job is probably one of the oldest books that there are. So so where are we at? Job 38, Job 38, and we'll jump down to verse. Now remember this, we're in Job 38. You remember Job 38? Long time ago, studying Genesis. What's this account right here? What's happening right here? The what? The creation of the planet Earth. All right? That's where we see it. We see the building tools, and God is rebuking Job, but he talks about where were you when all this stuff was happening there. And the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted together for joy. We studied about the sons of God and all of that. So we're in that chapter, but we're going to go on down a little ways, and we're going to look at verse 29 here. It says, Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven, who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. The face of the deep is frozen. Now, when it talks about the city of God in the third heaven, it talks about streets of gold, it talks about mansions, There's another aspect there, though, and I want you to think about that. If the face of the deep is frozen and it's right here, there's also something there called what? Anybody know what that phrase is? There's a crystal sea. The crystal sea is right there. Most likely what that's talking about where it says the deep is frozen. It's talking about that crystal sea because it's right up there by the third heaven where God's throne is. Okay? So, um, I want you to see that. Now, 
when you, when you look at this, and there's several other cool things in there, and we're, if we get into that, we'll be there forever. All right, so we're not going to go there. But you look at verse 41, canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? All this, it talks a, a lot about this Leviathan in chapter 41, but I want you to jump down. We're going to go all the way down to verse 32 for now. It says, he maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be, once again, that word, hoary, white, the manna. So, and I'm just showing you this because as we're trying to put details together of this defeating and striking of this dragon who is Satan there and it providing for this there, that within the deep, all right? It says, he maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. You know, you think about in all the stories, you hear of the fire-breathing dragon. So why, who was the original? It'd be Satan. Now, this, let's just put your little logical mind to work here, all right? If the deep is water, if the face of the deep is frozen... It says he maketh the deep to boil like a pot. What's he trying to do? He's trying to melt the ice so he can do what? Get to the third heaven. Look at you smart people. Look at you smart people, all right? But see, that's what, you're in the book of Job, taking it all the way over here and starting to see some of how this stuff ties together there, all right? So that's a, that's a good job there. That's good. So you got all of that. Now let's go back. <laughs> We're starting to get all over the place a little bit, but I wanted you to see it. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 2 and get back to the churches here because Pergamos, you've got this thing. I highlight it where Satan, where thou dwellest, where Satan's seat is. Back up here, it talks about the synagogue of Satan and it talks about the doctrine of Balaam and Balak there and he gives the instruction to him. We're in verse 17. It says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So, we are dealing with Pergamos right here. We're in verse 17, right at the end. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Right here. All right? So, we looked at all of that. Why? So that we could understand, what's this hidden manna about? And this is what you also have to understand. The hidden manna is not for us. We don't need the hidden manna. Why? We're not going through this. Why? That's us on the timeline. Before all this happens, we go up, judgment seat of Christ. Bad guys get kicked out. The place God has promised to us ain't nobody there but us and the good angels. And the Bible says, what are we going to do with the angels? We're going to judge angels. All right. So... So that's a cool thing that helps you kind of tie that in and see it all together there. But he'll give to eat of the hidden manna. That manna when he slaps the dragon upside the head maybe and uh, throws some, throw some, some honey-sweetened manna down to him there. So they're provided for for all those days. And I will give him a white stone. And that stone a new name written, which no man saving he that receive it there. Now, we're going to go real quickly because we're not going to cover too much about the white stone. We know the priest had a garment and he would have stones and gems and precious stones there on himself. Now, remember this. What did Lucifer look like in the beginning? What was his outward covering? Precious stones, right. And we see that in where? You'll see it in a minute, all right? It is, there's two places. Remember, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, you're seeing the prophecy of what is going to come to pass over here. And you're probably also seeing something historical that took place way back in time past. See, for some, they say, oh, Isaiah 14. It's just talking about, about you know, what's going to come over here. It's not back. But what are we seeing? How often does the Bible say, okay, if you see one thing back here, you're going to see it again over here. That he'll take something historical and also have something prophetical there. So that's important to remember as well. So that white stone and that new name that's given. 
The body of Christ is not promised a new name. We're promised a new what? A new body. All right? So, it's funny how you hear their song. Their songs are a hymn book. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. That's talking about the Lamb's Book of Life. Remember this. Our names were... Um, you know, you're driving me crazy. All right. <laughs> I thought I turned the notifications off, man. I was trying, I'm trying to use my notes on my iPad and use my phone here. And then, you know, there's those, those, those lovely people that just love you and won't leave you alone. All right. And though he knows where I'm at right now. All right. So with that, you know, just so you know up there in the sound thing, you, if you know, something pops up on the screen, please don't take it over there. <laughs> Yeah, I ain't no doubt. I ain't no doubt. We're going to make him do that for interrupting Bible study. All right. So back to, back to this. Where are we at? Well, uh, the white stone, the, the new name. So they are going to, that is a promise that they're given. And remember, in the Old Testament, you think about their names and their genealogies and how names meant stuff and represented things. You know, nowadays, you think about it, most time people get a name today and it's just, based on either a family name or mom and dad like the name, all right? But names were more prevalent back in with the genealogy and the generations leading up to the Messiah. For us, it's not as big of a deal. Thus, we're not promised that, all right? So we're going to jump in here to, chat, to um, verse 18, 19, excuse me. And um, actually, Pergamos, no, that's right, that's right. It starts with 18 there. With the rest of them. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, right, these things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now, we talk about this and we see it in the Bible how that when people come into the presence of Christ in his glorified state, basically they fall face down. This, when we see these attributes, this flame, these eyes as of a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, you know, this is, this is showing a representation of him coming in his power and in his judgment there. And we know it refers back over to chapter 1 there. So, uh, let's see here. I think I'm going to skip that part right there because I want to get on down just a little bit. It says, verse 19, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So, he's talking about that, the review. I know your works. I see the good things that you're doing there. So you got the angel of the church, you've got the, the revelator there and his characteristics. And then you get to verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, the reproof. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, here's something to put in your mind to think about. Remember we compared Balaam and Jezebel with Moses and Elijah during this time period. Now, personally, I believe that Moses and Elijah are going to be bodily upon the earth during this time, specifically during this time period right here. Because remember, they're going to die, they're going to be killed, and then they are going to be dragged around the street, they're going to stink, their bodies are going to be laid out there, and then they're going to get up. <laughs> They're going to get up and they are going to ascend. God's going to resurrect them and they are going to go up and that's one of the events that take place right around here. That's why as we get in this place, we'll see the Antichrist himself will be killed and resurrected as well. They're trying to, to show himself to, to be God. So it's interesting how it says, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication. So the question is, is it the teachings of Balaam and Jezebel, or, or is he going to actually be able to, to have them back there during that time, just like Moses and Elijah will be? Now that's one of those things I'm going to say, I don't know. I don't see really anything else that points in that direction, but it could be that way. So just kind of, kind of, some of those things like that, you just kind of got to roll it around in your head a little bit and let it just sit there in the back of your head 
and let it stay there as knowledge. So as you study and you see something else somewhere, it's like, wait a minute, I remember it said this, and now the scriptures say this, and you start tying the two together there. I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, you see it right there in verse 20, and if we go all the way back up here, I think it's verse 9. Uh, now verse, or it talks about Balaam here. Uh, verse 14. Yeah, verse 14. I have a few things against thee because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So you see that there. We come down to verse 20 to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols there. So remember this. One of the great temptations going on during this time to try to seduce people to follow the Antichrist and to take the mark of the beast is going to be the works of the flesh. You know, things sacrificed unto idols, that's probably going to be some of the best food you're going to see. It's going to be very appealing. You know, they're going to, you know, it's going to be laid out in the banquets and things like that, possibly. But it's going to be something that is going to seduce men to say, okay, you can suffer, you can be on the run, you can follow, or you can have all of this. So this thing with Balaam and Jezebel is about utilizing religion, trying to get people to um, uh, see a different God than the real God, and then to seduce them according to their flesh there. And it goes on, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now watch what it says. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. You see, during this time, there's going to be such definitive things. It's like, okay, you can have all this, but just understand, in a certain amount of time, you're going to die. You know, you've either got, you've got to this point right here. You can live it up, do whatever you want to do, but when I come back right here, and I come back to the earth, not just to the clouds there, I'm coming with wrath, and I am coming with judgment there, and there will be that, you know, if you, I think a week or two ago we looked at it and we showed how when under the doctrine of Balaam, remember, he taught, he says, okay, Balak, just get your people to commit fornication with the Moabites and God will judge them for you. That was the doctrine of Balaam. And what, how, how many people died because of that? Anybody remember the number, big number? Write it up here. 24,000. 24,000. And any of them that had went and yoked up with them and went to their feasts and did all that mess there, man, they got wiped out. And judges came through there and just started cleaning house. And there had to be that purging. Now, just understand, when, even when Christ comes back right here, what's he going to do? There's going to be a purging. There's going to be a cleansing. Just like today, I mean, if a person dies today, they have their whole life to trust Christ and they don't, then they're told and they're judged and they're sent to hell, all right? Well, what we see of these events that take place on the earth, we see some of this, the violence that goes throughout history there where there's times where God said, okay, these are my chosen people. This is the land I've given to them. You can do right or you can be judged. And remember, we talked about the ministry of Joshua. It's like, what did Joshua do for the Lord? He, he went into the land and killed people. He went in there and cleaned house. I mean, and he, was, he had to go into Jericho and wipe that thing out, man. So for sometimes for us, we talked about how that can be a difficult thing to understand and get a hold of. But that's where you got to be in your Bible and see these things so you can understand. I mean, there's a reason that God does all that he does. 
as, as, as much as he is a loving and a holy God and is gracious, at the same time, though, that holiness says that he cannot deal with sin. Thus, Christ had to go to the cross and die for sin there and experience his own violent death and shedding of his own blood there. So with that, you've got the, um, he says, I'll kill our children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say and unto the rest in Thyatira as many as have not this doctrine. Remember you had the doctrine of Balaam. You've got this doctrine here, and which have not known. Now, I want you, I, I highlighted this phrase because we saw the seat of Satan, the synagogue of Satan. It says, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. I will put it upon you, I will put upon you none other burden. But he makes that statement. That's what we're going to deal with for just a few minutes here. This depths of Satan. And what that means. Because see, if we just look at our Bible and we see the places where God sends judgment and God deals with things, what you have to do is you have to understand when you see that term, the depths of Satan, it's the depths of his wickedness, of his sin, of his vileness, and of who he is. And I want to show you some things here. We're going to go to the book of um, Ezekiel. We're going to go to the book of Ezekiel and see... You know, there's so many places that I can take you back in the Old Testament as we study Revelation, and I purposely don't go everywhere, but I'm trying to show you some places here. So as you study the Bible, you'll come and you'll see how these places relate to the book of Revelation and what's going on during this time period. So much of the Old Testament is not just showing you history of what went on back here, it's showing you prophecy of what is yet to come there. Because for most of most people, they go to the Old Testament and they don't know what it's talking about. They just it's, it's tough for them. They understand the stories and they can spiritualize things, but it's it's a tough thing there. So let's start here. Let's go to Ezekiel uh, 29. Ezekiel 29. And begin here. We're going to jump around a little bit, but it says, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon, that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which has said, My river is mine own. I have made it for myself. Hmm. So, Obviously, when we see the term dragon now, we know where our mind goes, all right? We've seen enough scripture to know. We can go all the way back to the oldest book, Job, and then all the way into the book of Revelation and the prophecy going on there. We see Leviathan. We see the great dragon there. Now, this is another place where, okay, you got, you got to put this in your thinking. Behold, I am set against the Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great dragon. Now, was Pharaoh the devil himself? No, he wasn't. Was he a type of that? Yes. He was a type of Satan, a type of the Antichrist to come. When I use the word types, all through the Old Testament, and even some of the New Testament, you have people who are types of Christ and types of the Antichrist. Their actions, the things they did, had similarities to either the nature and the behavior and the work of Christ or of the Antichrist there. So, Pharaoh is obviously a type of the Antichrist. He is called the great dragon. Now, you remember earlier when I said, I was telling Hunter, we were talking about uh, Lucifer and his outward covering? Where did I say that passage was? Do you remember? Ezekiel, remember the number? Football scores, think football scores by sevens. Does that help? It helps me. All right, because Isaiah's 14, Ezekiel's 28. There are there's sevens. I learned, I learned my, my times tables, I learned seven before I learned most of the others because of football, because of, of touchdowns. All right, that's just how I learned it there. The rest of them, I'm still working on it. I hadn't quite got there yet. But if you look, you saw that thing about Pharaoh and the dragon. Now, when you come back to Ezekiel 28, 
Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thy heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So, this king of Tyrus, was he a literal person? Yes. Was Pharaoh a literal person? Yes. But he's taking on that form of Lucifer in his actions and what he's doing. So if we come on down here, we're going to scroll down a little ways down to verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation, talking to Ezekiel, upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And it lists them all off there. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So what you see there with the king of Tyrus and what you see over here in Ezekiel 29 with Pharaoh being referred to as the dragon. You can see how that works together. And so as God is speaking to Ezekiel the prophet and giving him these words to, to say, these are prophecies dealing with this time to come. Because think about it. Right now, we're living in this time period right here. Let's say Jesus comes tomorrow. Boom. That's the date. We go up. We're gone. We're done with this earth. Life begins. All right? You got that little time period there, and then you're going to have the seven years of tribulation there. Think about the Bible and these people going through this time period. What are, what are they going to be looking at? You know what they're going to be looking at? They're going to be looking at the book of Ezekiel. They're going to be looking at the book of Daniel. They're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. They're going to be trying to figure out what's going on, what's coming next, so that they can have an assurance so they don't fall into the temptation of the fornication and the food and all that stuff that the spirit of Balaam and Jezebel is going to give them during that time. They're going to need that. You know what they're not going to need a whole lot of? <laughs> Romans <laughs> through Philemon. They're going to be looking at that about as much as we look at the genealogies and the, what goes on in the temple. You know, we don't read a whole lot about that. We don't, I mean, there's stuff we can learn from there, but for these guys going through this time, man, they got to know what's going on. They got to be able to identify things, and they're going to use these scriptures. And thus, that's why we got this stuff in the book of Revelation addressing these churches. Now, let's get back to this. You got Ezekiel 29, you've got Pharaoh there. Now we're going to jump down to, um, oh, let's see. Uh, actually, we didn't read verse 3. It says, speak and say, or did we? Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon, that lieth in the midst of the rivers, which has said, My river is mine own. Yeah, we read that one. All right? So, we're going to jump over to Ezekiel 31 for a second here and look at verses 2 and 3. Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian." was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Now this is a, this is a difficult passage, but we know who it's talking about. 